The Vril Codex by Ben Manning The Devil's Bible really exists, so called because of its large frontispiece illustration of the Devil and the medieval legends surrounding its creation. The Tool Society included Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler as members. The Nazis believed in Vril, a power and force that could heal, change and destroy beings and things. They masterminded the coming race ideology and stormtroopers of Satan phrase, yet the former was derived simply from a work of fiction they believed to be rooted in truth by Edward Bulwer Lytton. Fact or fiction? You decide. Prologue Gothic Berlin It was a night full of moonlight, and it filled the sky of a bleak Berlin landscape. Strange sounds echoed around the dark, looming fortress from the River Oder. Carved by the main gate, gargoyles stared downward along the walls, vying for attention from the ancient god Odin, who looked on from beyond our earthly realms. The demons carved in the ornate gate were surrounded by rune symbols, greeting any knowing visitor. There was a stirring inside the Germanic Tower. Of the mansion itself, its Gothic castle-style facade looked bleak and uninviting. Outside, shuffling could be heard on the steps to the looming tower. A figure was lit in the moonlight, a young woman moving erratically, her feet echoing and thudding around the old stone walls. When she reached the gate, she stopped. Having been there only minutes before, she reached for the rope she had attached previously to the spikes at the top of the gate, above the staring gargoyles. The gargoyles seemed to be laughing at her, at least in her imagination, as she struggled. Their expression mocked her, seemingly staring at her in her seeming greed. She was returning to what she believed originally from Tifops in the criminal underworld would be a successful hunting ground. On breaking in earlier, she knew she had dropped the most valuable goblet. Now she must retain her nerve and get back in and get it. Clutching her backpack, she pulled herself upward, then swung herself over the top, keeping hold of the rope. The walls around her and the gate itself were steep. She carefully lowered herself, keeping a keen eye on the ground below. As she reached the ground, she lost her grip, falling and misjudging her distance from the ground. She fell, damaging her foot, tearing her backpack on one of the prominent spikes. The contents of her bag spilled to the floor. Gold goblets, ancient plates, amulets, and ornate knives clanking onto the paving, shimmering in the moonlight. Nervously, she attempted to retrieve the contents, panting and panicking in equal measure. The moonlight felt like a burning sun on her back as it revealed her silhouette. Above her, the malevolent beasts looked down, menacing and evil, wise and omnipotent. As she grabbed the largest goblet in her hand, suddenly all the wind and sounds stopped, in an unnerving silence, as if time itself stood still. Nothing moved. After a few seconds, she dropped the artefacts and goblets into her bag and thankfully became aware again of the surrounding noises, insects and the sound of the nearby river. Reasserting herself, she fumbled for the remaining antiquities, most importantly the goblets, but stopping she suddenly became aware of a faint noise steadily increasing. As if to the beat of her palpitating heart, it was unlike anything she had heard before. It increased, becoming deafening. As she moved forward she grabbed her belongings and began to run towards the tower, but the noise seemed to be following her, coming from the gate. Suddenly she was paralysed. The undergrowth and long grass entangling her feet, she could not move. The eerie noise surrounding her head in a maddening cacophony. Looking up, it seemed the roaring gargoyles and devils appeared to be roaring in an unstoppable frenzy as the noise increased. Nearby, dropping her horde, she began running back toward the gate, her legs pumping and thudding on the concrete. Her breathing was heavy and frantic. She gasped. As a pain gripped her, she threw herself against the wooden gate, the old locks rattling like chains. Pulling herself up and over the gothic gateway once again, she dropped her backpack and it thudded to the ground. Now as the humming menace roared, her only thought was escape. 
Dropping downwards, she discarded any thoughts of recovering what she had stolen. She ran, screaming into the night, gripped by a kind of mania. Still the buzzing noises persisted. Tripping, the sounding surrounded her. Getting up, she flung her arms out as if fighting off a swarm of bees, or as if fires were surrounding her. She moved forward, blindly, but realised far too late that she was falling. She plunged over into the canal, a deep chasm of darkness, falling to her death. Yet suddenly, as a last scream echoed, the shadow evaporated. It had all been in her mind. As her psychically induced hallucination faded, she fell to her death. The haunting melody of Wagner could be heard from the house, from the tower above the music, emanated from an old 1930s gramophone player. It could be heard over the wind. Above, a woman, Helena von Hister, was standing by a window alongside the record player. The 78 RPM record spun around. The window was ajar, and she stood staring into the darkness, hair black as night. She was beautiful. She had an ageless face, but her features were dispassionate. She stood motionless, gazing to where the body of the thief, or possible assassin, floated briefly, then sunk with eyes lifeless into the dark waters. Chapter One In Every Dream Home, Heartache The Wilkinson's house stood on a quiet side road leading off from Barnes High Street. Barnes Village, as it was known, was adjacent to the long leafy Castle Now Road. It was a spacious but simple home, with modern and old-fashioned style, its furnishings worked nicely but had a traditional sense of cosy, home-like sensibility without being pretentious. In the front room, chairs, cabinets, paintings and tables all reflected the Wilkinsons' individual tastes based on experiences and memories, rather than any need to impress anyone else. Functional and stylish at the same time, there were paintings on the walls. They mixed traditional landscapes with modern oddball art. Though they had the money, the artist didn't concern the Wilkinsons, as long as Jane or Bob liked them or had a sentimental connection with the piece. Various news journals and popular newspapers rubbed shoulders with highbrow broadsheets and magazines. Under distinctive headlines to articles of war and tyranny and the greed of big business, there proudly sat the name Jane Wilkinson, photographer and journalist. Another article, The Future of the Environment by Jane Wilkinson, showed her depth and scope. Jane especially mounted framed copies of these many articles, but they were somewhere in the loft. She was far too modest to display them. She preferred visitors to stumble upon both her photography and her journalism. It was an unusual marriage of opposites, rather like Jane and Bob's marriage. On this evening, she sat head in hands. Jane frowned as the images flashed on her laptop in front of her. Images poured from all manner of websites. Her research fascinated her, but made her feel desperate for humanity at the same time. At 25 years of age, seemingly carefree, young and sexy, she had a maturity and knowledge far beyond her years. Wilkinson knew too well the scenes of horror and depravity in front of her. Whether it was of war or the corruption of those in high places, she had seen it all, as her furrowed brow attested. She looked up at a mournful portrait of Marilyn Monroe on the wall and she sat back, breaking the patterns of memories in her mind these images stirred. Leaning forward, she poured another glass of red wine. Swirling the glass in her hand, her face was interesting, with wide, childlike eyes, rather like those of her famous favourite actress. Disturbing her from a seeming reverie, a newsman popped up on a YouTube piece of footage. Robert Stevens, owner of Rajco, to attend conference on fighting third world debt, said the newsman. Jane chuckled to herself. Positive propaganda, she whispered under her breath. Despite her reverie, she focused enough to turn off her laptop as Bob and Sally Baldwin came in from the hallway. Honestly, I'm not kidding, Baldwin was explaining precariously trying not to spill her tea and biscuits. You have the best men in the world, Bob smiled to himself and murmured under his breath. I don't think George would like that very much, dear. 
He sat down, sweeping back his stylish black hair. Even he would agree with me, she replied. Sally set a table of various biscuits with a large antique teapot full of fresh tea. Baldwin was a sturdy buxom woman in her early forties, abrupt and bossy in a schoolteacher kind of way. She was Jane's agent and long-time confidant. A former journalist herself, and now a press agent, she ran her own agency, taking care of various journalists and press photographers. My husband knows he is no ideal Englishman. At least not the type that the... At least, okay, I get that you're slightly offended, but he's no ideal Englishman, not the type that the Americans lap up anyway. Turning to Jane, she continued, You're a lucky bitch anyway, you know. You know that, don't you? Not that I'm convinced these American fantasy squeaky clean Englishmen even goddamn well exists. But Bob's pretty close. <laughs> There's nothing lucky about meeting Bob, Jane said, smiling at her OTT American friend. He's my man. He's gorgeous and he knows it. She leaned over seductively, giving Bob a peck on the cheek, sending him red with a mixture of embarrassment, rather like a doting on a child. He felt intense sexual desire. He was just an innocent when I first met him. I've taught him everything he knows. He isn't that right, darling, she said with a naughty, sexy grin. Absolutely. Grinini glanced at Baldwin. I humour her. It's the only way. Standing behind the sofa, Jane became distant, wistful, always observing like an artist, savouring the simple domestic bliss. She knew as a go-getter that life was about taking risks, living on the edge for her art. All the life-threatening experiences had built up a long list in her short life. Now simply being and living was enough. Best of all was what lay in front of her. Her home and her friends and her husband, who was so special to her. Bob was her soulmate. She thought how she had been told marriage would change her life and hold her back and that she would settle down. However, her hunger for danger and cosy domesticity had never left her. Danger and life on the edge drove her, but there were always the protective arms of Bob to reassure her. Sugar or not? Sally asked the question of Bob whilst aiming to pour the beautiful earthenware teapot. No, thank you, said Bob, nodding toward the laptop. What's going on in the world tonight then, Jane? he asked. Jane moved over to the drinks cabinet, preferring a brandy. It seemed to the incumbent tea always present. No change, still a mess, she replied. Brandy? she asked, turning round. That's a silly question. <laughs> she knew not to ask Bob. He had been virtually teetotal for years. Jane walked back to the table inside, always admiring Bob's understated decency. When is George back, Sally? remarked Jane, going along with the somewhat trivial nature of proceedings thus far. Next week, as long as his mum's health has improved, bless him. Oh, smells of oak, thank you. Lovely. Bob made Sally laugh as they sniffed the brandy. Suddenly, the business was in the offing. When have you got to catch that plane on Monday, Jane? 5.30am, straight to Berlin. I could have done without the early start, but Berlin is a direct flight, thank God. Baldwin sat in the chair opposite with a mocking expression, but soothingly she sympathised. I hate early mornings too, darling. Jane crossed the room looking at the various magazines and newspaper articles of hers, arranged by Bob, of course. I'm not really, I'm not really looking forward to this job. It's not my scene at all. Horrible place, she said. You'll be okay once you've got there. They say it was the most vibrant art and young people seen in Europe, said Bobby reassuringly. It's too late. The contract's signed. It's a done deal, darling, asserted the breathy and husky business-like voice of Sally's, sounding terribly like an over-the-top acting coach at times. I closed that deal, sweetheart, and you know I did a great job. I agreed in a moment of weakness. You know how it is. Jane then whispered in reply. Oh, come on, Sally blurted back. You have to be insane to have to turn that one down. Steve Blake rang me today. There's another job in Iraq. I'd, I'd love to get my teeth into that one, replied Jane with an expression that conveyed she felt it a more relevant assignment. Bob's concern was plain to see. Look, Jane, you've risked your net so many times. Please don't do another dangerous job, please. Jane replied with a firm tone. 
Somebody's got to cover these things and educate others about what's happening. Can't you see that? Breaking news is what I'm good at. A good hard story, not some sightseeing tour in dreary Germany. She looked at Sally, narrowing her brow. Yes, but your yours takes on architecture, and y- yours are always unique. Rem- remember the piece you did on Albert Speer? It was highly acclaimed, Bob responded. Baldwin interjected. That's what the broadsheets are doing. They are after less danger and more creativity and some positive news for a change. Baldwin knew her words were nonsense in reality, but she, along with Bob, still tried to continue the persuasion. You can't be Kate Aidy or Melvin Bragg at the same time, dear. You need to specialise. Specialise on something safe for a change. They want to see all things Germanic, ancient and modern. Right now, it's, it's fashionable in all the architectural journals and magazines I've been reading. Jane looked perplexed. But why me? All my best recent work has been Zimbabwe, Darfur, Africa, Iraq, Afghanistan. Why middle of the road? Post-retirement stuff. Because. Baldwin paused, thinking of the best counter-argument. You won an award with the arts documentary you did on architecture. Everybody loved it. Jane tried to turn the argument around again. That was a different situation. It was a it was a different offer and it seemed like something different to show my human creative side. I'm not a faceless presenter. Everybody knows that you're already you, you you've nearly been kidnapped twice, for Christ's sake, said Baldwin, who looked increasingly desperate. Bob smiled over his hot tea at Jane. It will only be a few a few months travelling. Germany and Berlin, and then you'll have a bestseller on your hands because of your reputation alone, won't you? said Bob, trying to help, but really fighting within himself. But Jane then winced with guilt. Great, so all those stories I reported, no one cares about. All, all, all that I've achieved, a bestseller? Well done, me. Is that what it's all about? Sally and Bob looked mystified at each other. Look, there's no law against you taking creative time out in between times and then covering the odd news story, Bob said. I suppose you're right said Jane grudgingly. Sally then nearly spilled her tea. Preferably, you won't get kidnapped, tortured and murdered. Jane then softened, appreciating the tough love, coupled with the common sense. She sat by Bob, running her feline fingers sensuously through her hair, and then he Would you really miss me, darling? Bob frowned. Don't ever say that, not even as a joke. Sorry. Often, she didn't seem to appreciate Bob's real love for her. I'm sorry, but I still think this isn't the right time. The right sort of work for my skills. Don't worry, Jane. The publishers know what they're doing. Have faith. Besides, Bob could join you for a bit of how's your father, as you say in England. (laughs) I mean, a, a break in Berlin. Very funny, Sally. Jane was inside, slightly smarting at the over familiar and overbearing agent, however much she was a friend. Pity you can't go out there together, Bob, added Sally. Well, I'm only halfway through that job for the English cricket board. I've used enough paper on this series, I can tell you. Still, any excuse to see a free test match, eh? The head guy seems to think highly of my profiles and general work with the players. Easy journalism for me, really. Jane looked at her husband encouragingly. So he should. You're like a walking cricket encyclopedia. I bet you could teach those players a thing or two. Sally didn't usually look after both a journalist and a photographer in one go. Both clients were unique. Jane whispered to Sally whilst Bob's back was turned as he went to get a glass of water. I think it's high time Bob was on your books. He's got to the top of his narrow profession all by himself. You could get him more varied work and broaden his horizons. Great idea, whispered Baldwin. Let's branch you into other sports, Bob, said Sally when Bob returned to the room. Ever thought of TV presenting? I know a few people in that industry say so and I will get you in there. Bob could never take flattery or generosity as it was intended. His modesty found it surprising. Surely it's not that easy. Actually, much as I enjoyed enjoyed doing it, I'm, I'm not sure it's for me long term. Sports journalism was a lucky break, but not long term. I'm not sure I'm not sure we need two, however different journalists in one household. Sally looked perturbed at the lack of confidence from Bob. How sad, she thought to herself. He had it all. Dark good looks, 
cockney voice, tall, handsome and clever. Much like his wife in terms of the looks and the skills, though in truth he was not quite the ideal man each woman in the room perceived. Bob's personality and charisma seemed to imply that he had a very, well, pretty much every attribute. In truth, he had struggled with dyslexia all his life and was no more than average in looks. Hey, you've, you've already made it, so it's too late. You are a cricket journalist and photographer, whether you like it or not. Well, you're getting paid after all. It's not like a hobby to, to just drop, said Jane encouragingly. Bob smiled at Sally. I'm freelance. I had a lucky break at a friend's cricket dinner, purely networking. It's not long before a Cambridge upstart with the right background will gazump me. They're all private school. I haven't got the right accent. Sally looked impatient. Fine, yes, yes, yes. But when you change your mind, the offer's on the table. Look, she said, nodding. She clicked her fingers as if it could be he's in a thrice. Ta, he said, smiling. Sally smiled at them both, agreeing. A toast, I think. Here's to Jane Wilkinson's art and design book on Berlin, then and now. Later on, after a few more brandies and Sally's hesitant departure, Jane and Bob eased between the sheets and made love. Their passion for each other was like nothing else either had ever known. As fresh as a virgin experience in a frenzy of loving ecstasy, it began as slow, loving, warm, intimate sweetness and culminated in writhing, wet, thrusting joy. Soft lights entered through the gaps in the bedroom curtains, lighting their limbs entwined like a sculpture, seeming as one. They panted like panthers at first, gasping for breath, the sweat sweet and strong bonding them. Bob smiled at Jane. That was indescribable. Better not be. I want a full review written by the morning, she said, smiling. I love you. Thank you, my love. OK, what are we going to chat about now? Do you want to talk about going to the Quantocks, Somerset Hills? said Bob excitedly. It was only a thought. It's one I had travelling back on the train from the, from the Quantocks a few weeks ago. How do you know? He had to be psychic. But then, so did she. For years now, she wondered, and how she knew when the phone would ring, or when an email would arrive from him before it even happened. Bob would suggest something literally as she thought it, a sixth sense, or ESP, as it is known. She viewed this as proof of their love. Neither had experienced it with anyone else. This is scary, but special, Jane said, pulling him closer. Let's start looking properly for somewhere, she agreed. Together they now lingered longingly. She turned over from her back to him thinking how lucky she was. A long dragon tattoo ran the length of her back. Years of pain, rejection and being used had left her scarred. She could barely believe she had found such a sensitive, kind man. Together they could do anything, she felt. They were so different. Bob was the son of a politician and from a rich background. Financially, he was secure, but creative too. In his youth, he had dropped out of college and rebelled, even ending up homeless at one point. In a way, he had revisited the working-class roots of his family history, going back decades. His father's history was very much a rags-to-riches story. In contrast, hers had been a chequered past, from a run-down area of London's East End. All she had ever had as a young girl were her looks. Soon she found funding. University was no problem for her, through a variety of means, the sex industry being one of them. Usually she turned to stripping in West Soho nightclubs. She had even worked as an exclusive escort as a young 18-year-old. But thankfully these routes were forgotten, the newspapers unaware. A truth that even Bob had accepted. It was in the past, gone. Their closeness took her away from her aims and goals, which disturbed her. But she enjoyed every moment. It helped her to live. Their minds and bodies were so immaculately matched, she looked at Bob. I wish I wasn't going away. I can't live or function sometimes without you, darling. Don't say that. We need this bit of extra money. And Sally could do her. She would do her nut if you didn't do it. Besides, I need a break, he joked. Jane hugged him closely. A fearful, foreboding, hollow pit in her stomach rose as she thought of the Berlin trip. 
something she hadn't felt for years, like her first day at school. She put it down to the fact that Bob meant everything to her. She couldn't live without him, she thought, and sighed contentedly. End of chapter one.